Hey, listen up. Yeah, we here and we locked in. Let's keep it going all the way to the top 10. We feel the thorough, so it's no other option. Fred and Ryan, just watch them. Let's take it to the max. It's the shell and tell. They come with all the facts. It's the shell and tell. Let's take it to the max. It's the shell and tell. They come with all the facts. It's the shell and tell. back another episode of shell and tell for all you guys that haven't turned off the football season and moved on to basketball with the second loss of the season we will still be here looking at every game as as we go through our season and only giving up on the inside um not really the outside <laughs> yeah obviously we get a chance after coming out of the the bye week from maryland football uh you get a chance to Get back in the win column, uh, pick up the first Big Ten win of the season, and as Michael Oxley looks to pick up his first win uh, in uh, games coming out of the bye week uh, since taking over as head coach. So uh, definitely, you know, a lot, lot, lot of questions. That stat locks, yeah. please fix it. <laughs> lot, lot, lot of, a uh, lot of questions to answer this week. So um, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been an interesting first month to say the least. Yeah, as you all know, uh, coming off a 42-28 loss, another one of these losses in Maryland's history that like. We just can't seem to finish the game out, and they just look so much worse than they are. Um, I don't think that the collapse at the end really was the problem. I think it was the fact we did not convert on three interceptions or three turnovers in the first half and get any points. But still, this was a seven-point game in the fourth quarter. Uh, this was a 50-50 on your ESPN percentage transactions late in the third quarter. Like, it, this was not a blowout until it was. And we just continue to do this. I think it was, what, three touchdowns in the last 11 minutes. And it just really doesn't help in the future world, these recruiting worlds that we talk about where all they're doing, if they haven't been Maryland fans in the past, is scrolling through stat lines, and this looks terrible, and the Penn State losses look terrible, and the Michigan losses look terrible, even though we've played a few of them really tight late in games. Yeah, um, you know, I think it was just kind of, you know, chance for um, Maryland to kind of, like you said, you know, just kind of really get get back and prove itself uh, coming out of that Michigan State game. And, you know, uh, Indiana, you know, I think that was really a chance for them to kind of validate themselves as well. Uh, this is a chance to initially move to 5-0. and Now they've since moved to 6-0 and with the eventual win over Northwestern this past Saturday. But, um, you know, for Maryland, I think, you know, some of those questions or some of those issues, excuse me, um, centered, you know, with the biggest question marks going into the season, you know. Uh, quarterback play and offensive line, you know, I thought uh, Billy Edwards, um, you know, obviously, like you said, you know, turning, winning the turnover battle, not, uh, not turning any points into it. Um, that's a huge glaring stat for Maryland right there. But uh, I thought there were a couple of times where Billy held on to the ball a little bit long and then offensive line to pass, uh, pass blocking a little bit, you know, there was, um, you know, there, there, there was definitely some, some room to grow there. Um, obviously, you know, we get a chance to see Therese Davis later in the game there again, as he got a chance to play against uh, UConn, Villanova, um where he got a chance to really see extended time there so um uh, I, I think i think you know it'll be kind of interesting to see what maryland looks like offensively um and then again you know special teams wise you know to, to, to allow that um block punt to end the game there i think was kind of uh disappointing for maryland i think you know punt the punt unit under bryce mcpherson has kind of been a strength for maryland um and i think just kind of uh you know loxley punting uh, or suggesting to, to punt uh, right before that as well, uh, kind of waving the white flag as he called it after the game. I um, think there was just kind of deflating signs for Maryland. Um, and again, you know, in, in year six, uh, these are the, the the types of issues, the, the recurring issues that Maryland fans um, have seen for the first five years now. And um, I think that those continuing to show up now uh, in these losses uh, is what really, really bothers fans. Yeah, it's, it is terrible. I fully agree with you on the offensive line. Again, like you said, this was our fear all along. I said this offensive line was not going to be able to hold up to Big Ten play. Uh, it, it very much showed its head here. I mean, most of the pressure on Billy was with four-man fronts. They didn't have to do much. Uh, it got worse and worse over the time of the game, showing that they just really didn't have the stamina to keep it up with these guys. Uh, I, I, it really doesn't look good uh, for the for the de the defensive line versus offensive line battle. The quarterback play, uh, you know, he Billy was playing with one hand tied behind his back. You lose 
Um, well, the defense loses Trader early, early, and then the offense loses Felton. You know, his security blanket, the guy that's been all world all year. What was it? Maybe second quarter. Um, and and so then after that, you even lose Prather, your number two guy who was showing up. Who, by the way, if that does, call doesn't get reversed, hits my eighty yards. I'm real sad about that call, and we'll talk about that some more because I think it was a bullshit reversal. I'm not sure it was a touchdown, but I think it was a bullshit reversal. Yeah, uh, I think it, you know that was tough. Obviously, with Trader Trader going down there, I think it was actually first first series of the game. Um, so you know, I think that was big big departure there. Obviously, and then you know you talked about just kind of the offensive line. I mean, um, really not talking about, but just the penalties. You know, Merrill finished ten for ninety three yards. Um, you know, uh, I think that's the, the fourth consecutive game where Merrill has finished with at least eight eight penalties. Um, and I think again when we talk about the recurring issues that really um, you know don't, don't sit well with fans. Uh, it, it, it's those, you know, we saw it starting in 2019 through uh, 2020, 21, and 22. And, um, you know, Loxie, you know, he, he mentioned it post game, you know, this is year six now. These are all his guys. Um, you know, this is 100% his problem um, at this point. And, um, you know, I think, again, you know, Maryland, part of it is, you know, players executing it. Um, so I think, you know, there, there's kind of seemed like been a little bit of a change of tune uh, in order to try and kind of cut down on some of these penalties. But, um, until Maryland does so, it's it, they're they're kind of in uh, show me category right now. They're certainly in show me category, and with our schedule, we're going to have plenty of opportunities for show me. So we'll see. But let's break into this review just for a second because I got to get it off my chest. I just I, I I get it. It might not have been a touchdown. I saw the elbow touch quote before the knee, like. But did we? Because all we saw was that his knee extended from impact after the elbow touched outside. In order to overturn this call, you need indisputable evidence. In order to make a catch, all you have to do is touch the bristles of grass. Also, there is a pad on said knee. If you can't see air under the knee when his elbow's down, I don't know how you reverse it. And 100% you could not see air under the knee. I fully agree his knee did not start moving until the elbow touched out of bounds and one millisecond later his knee was extending i just don't know how that's indisputable evidence i don't know that's how beyond a reasonable doubt if you want to call it in like legal terms like it just didn't make any sense to me and then insult to injury we lose prather on that play for an extended period of time somehow he got back into the game kind of looked like he was discombobulated because you had zlowski telling him where to go and pushing him around the, the offensive uh formation there but it just really didn't sit well with me that that was a reversal. Another time we've been within seven points at the end of the game. I know I'm the fan here. I know I bleed and have rose-colored glasses, and I'm I'm going to see it Maryland's way, but it just doesn't seem indisputable to me. Yeah, um, uh, I think that was kind of a tough break for Maryland there. But, um, again, you know, you talked about just Prather going down. I thought that was, um, you know, he, he kind of played through some injuries there in the fourth quarter as well, um, injuries ended up being a bigger problem for Maryland uh, to close that, that fourth quarter there. Rough, absolutely rough. I mean, that's what after this game really sat with me was, I mean, if you told me that we lost Indiana because we lost Trader and Felton early and Prather kind of early, like, yeah, that makes sense. But what it really did to me was like, I guess subconsciously before this game, this was my like get right game for Michigan state to make Michigan state not matter because like you predicted at the end of the year that there was a good chance we lost Indiana or Minnesota. And so like, if you beat Indiana, I guess my head was just going to erase the Michigan state loss. And so after this loss, all I could really think of was, was like the woulda, coulda, shouldas in Michigan state. It wasn't even really, it was a little bit, a couple minutes of you got to score when you have three turnovers in the first half. How did we not score points? Which, of course, is a huge issue. I'm sure it was a big focus in practice this week. But really, all I could do is, like, how did we blow a Michigan State game? It just makes these penalties stack up, and you look forward, and you're like, how do we get to a bowl game? Because really, like Locke said, six has to be the floor now. You can't – we can't go back to the days where we're not making bowls. It's, it's not going to be good for the future of this program. Yeah, uh, I think obviously, you know, you get back um, the favorable chance this weekend, obviously against Northwestern. Uh, but, you know, again, that's it's tough. You know, in November, Maryland's currently projected to play uh, two teams that's in the top five and Oregon and Penn State, and both those games are on the road. Uh, you got a trap game or, you know, potential trap game at Minnesota who just took down USC at home. Um, what a game. Yeah, yeah, that was a, that was a, a great comeback for Minnesota there. And I think, you know, again, 
you know, I kind of, I think I really think, you know, kind of deviating from the point, but I think this big 10 is really just wide open. I, you know, I think Ohio state right now is probably the top team in the conference, but I, I think it's just, there's a lot of teams right now kind of vying for second and uh, maybe, maybe it's Penn state, but you know, I think it, again, you know, that there's a lot of teams that kind of need to prove themselves right now. But, you know, again, speaking of prove themselves, Maryland is in that category, you know, so um, you talk about getting back to, to a bowl game. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, I was talking about it with the coach uh, over the weekend, you know, Maryland just has to wait, uh, has to find a way to get to six uh, this year. Uh, and I, you know, I think that they, they do stack up well against Northwestern this weekend. Uh, but again, we're just sticking with that Indiana performance. Um, it, again, it's, it's the, the same types of issues uh, that, that keep coming up. Um, and again, you know, I think how Mar- Merrill looks offensively, I think will be uh, really interesting to see. Yeah. I mean, in order to get back to where we need to be, Felon's going to have to be healthy. Prather's going to have to be healthy. We got to get our weapons back because, Billy just playing point guard and quickly getting the ball out to athletes is how you win because we're just we don't have the the want to and the will to be able to move men when they know you're running the ball like that's until this this program gets the absolute dogs on the offensive line and you can have a third and two and you have your best three players to left they know your best three players to left and you run left and get it like there is there's a ceiling. I think the ceiling's better than six. It might still be eight or nine on a good year of having the ball bounce your way. But like we we need offensive line. I know we have a good a good few commitments, but it just takes so much more. That's the struggle at being a, a program this size is like you have to get three, four, five offensive linemen that are legit in order to actually move a program like that. Yeah, and I think I mean I think that's valid, but you know I kind of talked about it through the off season. You know, you look at the portal commitments this off season that Maryland got. Um, Josh Gatlinberger, obviously, he has one year of eligibility left. So uh, after that's this twenty twenty four season, you know he'll he'll move on. Um, so, but you know, uh, Aliyah Ba, Alan here on both those guys, um, they have an, at least one more year. Isaiah Wright, who uh, went down super super early after he arrived on campus, um, he'll have two additional years of eligibility left. So. You know, you, you talk about obviously getting some dogs in the offensive line. And, you know, Therese Davis, uh, I think think he'll be really interesting. He looks really he, good. Just he looks young. really good. Yeah, and, and, you know, he, I you know mentioned it in practice. Some, as the, yeah. Um, but, he, you know, he's lined up for, primarily as right tackle there. And then, you know, we, I believe it was the Villanova game where he lined up at left tackle. And then the following week, this past week against Indiana, or you know, two weeks ago against Indiana, um, it was uh, at, at uh, right tackle again. So just kind of that versatility, that's super, that's a, that's a tall task for a freshman. Um, kind of down the line, you know, I think it'll be interesting. You know, I think good chance that he does take a tackle, whether he shifts to, to center and gives, um, you know, a guy like Tamaris Walker a run as a starting center next year. I think, you know, that'll be kind of interesting. Or the Maryland ops are good for a portal guy, keep Therese Davis as a tackle. That'll be interesting as well. But, um, you know, again, I, I think this offensive line, when you talk about just this season, um, I think they've, they've had their strides, but uh, they made their strides. But um, again, you know, I think that it kind of takes some time. And uh, for, you know, Alan Huron, you know, a guy that came from the D2 level, um, he's a guy through the offseason. You know, a lot of people talk about him as potentially being that next NFL guy in the room. Um, but, you know, that next NFL guy with two full seasons. Um, and I think right now he's kind of going through that adjustment period. <laughs> Super fast guy. I mean, he, he's, he moves very well for his size. Uh, but I think just kind of getting ready, getting acclimated for that Big Ten level, uh, I think that's a big thing. And then again, like I mentioned, uh, he's expected to be back next year as well. So, um, you know, it, Braswell definitely. So you're telling me my theory's right, but the team's ahead of where I think they are. Is that kind of like the the synopsis here? Uh, I mean, I, I I I don't know about that, but I think you know, just right now, I think you know, offensive line. I mean, I think that there's reason for optimism right now for the future. And then obviously, like you said, you know, you think about the 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 next wave of that offensive line, you know, I've been consistent uh, for IBG subscribers, but, you know, Michael Hershey, uh, Ryan Howerton, and Therese Davis uh, both consistently have been in uh, with the second team at center, right guard, right tackle, uh, really since the first scrimmage of fall camp. So, um, you know. Yeah, I know Hershey got some run in that last game. I remember hearing his name called. Unfortunately, when you hear your name called as an offensive lineman, it's usually a bad thing, but. (laughs) No, I mean, you know, Maryland tries to, you know, they're pretty intentional with getting, getting guys reps uh what games and at what points in the games things like that you know that's why loxy a couple weeks ago and or the villanova game that's why he kind of talked about how he's disappointed about how that middle eight in the game kind of took away from some of those reps to develop the rest of their roster so um uh, i think you know through the, through the first four or five weeks i think that's you know kind of 
what what fans should kind of expect just getting some of these younger guys on the field and, and kind of getting their feet wet getting getting them some live reps but um again you know just for for this season uh i think these this really this bye week is really that chance for that offensive line to really take that step forward dive deep into the film dive drill into technique and um again figure out and get back to what they're doing uh what works on offense and uh get back to doing it so we're coming we we got a much needed week of rest clearly we already talked about three big guys that were injured this week i believe there were a lot more nicked up what is the maryland's health status looking like this week coming out of the bye week yeah it sounded like there were a lot of guys this past week kind of held out it sounds like a lot of them you know kind of potentially for precaution some of them just kind of getting some rest but you know it sounded like there were many as 14 guys held out of practice but um you know obviously like you mentioned you know keaton prather ty felton both those guys uh trying to play through you know undisclosed injuries uh through the fourth quarter there dr trader going down so it sounds like there's optimism that all three of those guys come back um neil avery you know he's another guy he's kind of um you know, played the first two games and then haven't seen him since the michigan state game um he his status kind of up in the air as well um but um again the 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 five we came at a came at a crucial time for sure yeah that would, would have been not fun to play with all those guys even against northwestern missing it's, it's not that's not somewhere we want to be. Uh, how, so what changes do you see coming out of this bye week? What can you really accomplish with this week off? Yeah, I think special teams wise, you know, obviously cleaning up the coverage a little bit, you know, uh, that, that block punt at the end of the Indiana game, I think, um, you know, doesn't really, you know, leave the, the best taste in the mouth, you know, going into the bye week. Um, so I think, you know, obviously the kicking game as well has been, a, you know, a, been been a work in progress. I know Jack House has been, uh, it's kind of taking that next step, done a good job, kind of winning that job through fall camp. Um, and then defensively, you know, kind of limiting those chunk plays on the ground and kind of setting the edge a little bit better. Uh, but I think the biggest takeaway this this coming out of the bye week is really going to be on the offensive side of the ball. Um, I think, you know, everyone knows now that this is Mike Loxie's offense, you know, that this is um, his, his, his scheme, his identity. Um, and I think, you know, him, you know, potentially, you know, playing a bigger influence uh in the in the you know the the, the play calls and in terms of the day-to-day um i think that that'll probably be a bigger focus kind of moving forward uh, at least in the short term um to get maryland back to what they're doing well uh, you know again you know, playing to their strengths a little bit um getting billy edwards comfortable uh in the pocket in the rpo game as well so uh, i think that's that's kind of probably the biggest thing and again you know uh, the the penalties, the, those the, the the recurring issues that we talked about uh, at the beginning of this podcast, you know those those are still prevalent. You know, Maryland still has to address those, and Maryland will have to you know figure out a way to you know translate that from the practice field onto the game field. You know, and that's a big thing. But um, when you talk about offensively, um, you know, just I think you know there's there's a level of fit, of efficiency and and explosion that this offense can reach. Um, and I think this this bye week was really when they're able to kind of d- draw, yeah, dial in and uh, drill into the, you know, what's working and what isn't and uh, what they need to do. Yeah. I'm a little scared to say it, but I do want to give credit and maybe I'm wrong. I haven't looked at the stats, but just personal feeling anecdote. I do feel like there's been less of like the 15 yard personal foul type penalties that we were just so mad about for years with this team. Certainly there's still the non-competitive penalties, the procedural stuff, the holds, the well holds are competitive, the false starts, the um, lining up incorrectly and correct formations, that kind of stuff that just kills you when yeah. that that's just head game stuff but i do think that they've they've at least improved a little bit on the personal fouls there's always gonna be one it's a hot-headed game these are dudes that are trying to murder each other between whistles and you're supposed to be nice as soon as the whistle blows it's just not gonna happen yeah um, and i think you know it's the the, the pre and post snap penalties again like you, you said you know those, those are kind of i mean again you know maryland did have a couple you know there was uh, like that one drive where maryland had um two 15 yard penalties in the span of three plays that uh, it was 35 yards and penalty yards on the drive. So, um, again, you know, th- those are kind of things. Again, uh, I think all three of those were attributed to the offensive line. Uh, one of them was all on Uh The other was on Aliyo Ba. I believe the third was on Kyle Long. Uh, but, uh, again, you know, the, the Maryland has kind of taken some some steps there. Uh, but, again, you know, the, the, the penalties. Certainly not the Jay Sean Jones days where he had 85 yards by himself. <laughs> yeah, no. As an, as an underclassman, we, we, we should have As an underclassman, he, yeah, he got better. He, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he went six years. So, I mean, he, uh, but yeah, yeah, again, you know, Maryland, you know, just kind of uh, taking that step forward. But, um, but yeah, uh, again, I think Maryland kind of has to really, again, like I talked about it, they have to really show me that they can kind of take that step forward in terms of the, 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 um, 
the bad the bad mistakes. Um, don't want to call them stupid penalties, but you know the you know the the unsportsmanlike. Yeah, you know they're they're just you know it, the margin for error uh, isn't as big this year, so um, you just you can't really dr- d- you know cut into that a little bit. So uh, again, you know I think that the biggest takeaway though is uh, what this offense looks like. Uh, you know in, uh, on it in stripes. I'm going to throw you a curveball here. Uh, we didn't talk about this. We didn't add this in. This is uncut and honest, everybody. Uh, but it's a conversation that me and Fred had today, uh, mostly on my side of things, because I still feel bad about missing out my boy Nick Harbor down there on South Carolina. Um, but I'm starting not to feel bad anymore um, because we seem to get the better end of the deal. I don't want to call it dodged a bullet, but I do want to say that Dylan Wade has a stat line of 12 for 183 and two and Nick Harbor is seven for 51 and zero. Uh, and last year we had another tight end, you know, that w- went off for quadruple what Nick Harbor w- produced down there. Is this a South Carolina problem? Would he have been different in our system? Is this the fact that we thought we missed, but we actually got the better end of the deal? What's your take? Or do we just, uh, yeah. Not answer this. I don't care. I, I just threw, no. you, threw you under the bus here. <laughs> no, no, I didn't throw me under the bus at all. Um, no, I mean, so I'll say this. I remember, I remember when Dylan Wade was in high school, um, and I think it was a couple of weeks into his senior year, and he tweeted, he's like, "I'm going to be a defensive lineman," and everyone was like, oh, "Okay, he wants to be a defensive lineman." And I was pretty consistent. You know, he he wants to be that. You know, he, he can be a good defensive lineman at the high school level, but you know, is his projection and what what really excited Maryland was his his potential on the offensive side of the ball. And I think, you know, like you said, you know, just his, you know, it's that six two frame, but his just crazy athletic uh and sure handed uh tight end right there. I think, you know, he he's a guy really since the day he stepped on campus where he he's kind of been a guy that they've been consistently happy about. Um so his production is kind of a one A, one B get alongside Preston Howard. No surprise to me. And I think kind of going into this year, I don't think a lot of Maryland fans are surprised about it. But um, when you talk about Harbor, again, I'll always say um, DMV guys, when it comes to Maryland, like they will always get looked out for well. Like they'll always be put in a good spot. They'll always have people looking out for them, like truly making sure that they are set up for success. Um, and that's not to say that other schools won't do that, but it, it's to say that, you know, some schools, you know, you, you could be just another cog in the system. Um, what I will say for, you know, in Harbor's case in South Carolina is that, you know, when he signed, you know, even I mentioned, you know, it's going to take some time for him to really develop into a legitimate power five, power four now uh, skill player. You know, when I was at Carroll, I mean, just to be blunt, he wasn't really ever developed. And even in the games, he would get a couple targets at most uh, a game. So, I mean, he really never had too many chances to really uh, showcase himself at the high school level. Um, so I think this is really a chance where he's, you know, just starting to put it all together. Um, he's also down in the track. He's doing really well in track. And I think that's kind of, you know, kind of complicated the process for him a little bit. Um, and I think, again, you know, wide receiver, I think why South Carolina, I think last I heard that it looks like they're using him more as a wide receiver now not, uh, rather than a tight end. Which makes more sense, you know. He's got this that, just I mean, you I don't know how many players in, in college football, even with his stat line, um, can match his speed. But again, you know, it takes time for him to develop as a you know as a refined wide receiver. Um, so I think that's kind of his his issue right now. And again, hey, you know, how, how much longer will he play football before he does focus on track? You know, uh, we'll, we'll we'll see about that. But um, you know, again, I, I don't know about if it's as much of a South Carolina. I think it's just a a Nick Harbor issue and you know a couple of my buddies they went to South Carolina so I give them shit all the time but you know they they're at the point now where they're like dude Harbor he's just he's not good and I'm like this is like you, you guys are being impatient you guys are misevaluating like that's just like if anybody expected him to come in day one and be an impact I mean you just you either misevaluated or you just saw the numbers that were on his uh, recruiting profile. So um, I, I think, you know, again, you know, this, that, that South Carolina offense, they've, they've kind of shown some flashes, you know, through the first four or five weeks. I know they had a, uh, they blew that L- LSU game, but um, you know, I think, I think he could have get a chance, but um, you know, it, it, he really just has to develop as a, as a wide receiver right now as a skill player. Yeah. I, I, you gotta believe that even, the trouble Maryland's having 
if you're a tight end that wants to show out and get to the league, Maryland has to be climbing the list of places to go do that. You have Chiga Conquo, you have Corey Deitches, now you have Dylan Wade. They're all putting up like wide receiver numbers, not tight yeah. end numbers in, in these positions. Not to mention the guy that went to Alabama. I'm drawing a blank right now that bailed on us after the handshake with Ohio State. Um, uh, Dupree. Dupree, CJ Dupree. Dupree, who had two great years before he bailed out to Ohio to Alabama to do basically nothing but block. Um, so it's just this 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 system will show you off. So like we have to at least be climbing the ranks in in that area, and we're gonna get guys that are even more highly recruited, highly touted. Dylan Wade's still very young. We've got another year with him, hopefully, unless he does something crazy like we did, saw last year and demands thirty million dollars where he's going to Charlotte. That's good. Uh, but you know, it, it, it is what it is. Uh, you just got to take the go with the bad. And that was one of the few things that I saw this weekend that made me smile, chuckle, whatever. I, I feel bad for the kid. He's got unbelievable talent. Maybe football is not his thing. Like you said, maybe it's just, I'm going to go win a gold medal and then I won't feel bad for him at all. He did what he wanted to do. He used South Carolina for what it was for football paid for his scholarship, but he really got the training and track that he wanted. Cool. If that's what you want to do. Great. But like, I, I, dudes with those that those talents and all the hype that was built this year over the video game and how bonkers he was in the video game release this summer like for that to come out and you'd be six seven games in and have 50 yards and no touchdowns it's just got to be a letdown somewhere in his head it has oh, to. yeah I, he was the biggest enough. hotness all summer long because of video game controllers yeah no no doubt i mean again you know i, I got him in the second my second season and you know, I was just throwing throwing fade balls to him all day, and but you know, I think I scored eighty through three times in four weeks. So I mean, yeah, no, no doubt. I'm sure you know he says, "Damn, why can't I do that in a real game?" But again, you know, it's 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 part of the process. You know, it's uh, it, you know, I, there there was always work to do with there. Okay, well, you know, you you again, uh, I I just I'm one of those guys like you said that read the stat sheet and saw how fast he was and how big he was, and they're telling me he's a you know, yeah. star, star numbers. So I'm ready to like snap my fingers and watch them do things. But as usual, I'm as the informed one. I'm just the guy here to pump my chest and talk about Maryland. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, it should be good. Yeah. Well, we got to move on to the next week and uh, hopefully we'll have better news by the end of this Northwestern game. Northwestern is not looking very good on the season. I thought they were going to be a complete walkover. Um, and again, in his uh, infinite wisdom here, it seems uh, had us, press pause and wait till after we watch the Northwestern and Indiana game before we recorded this podcast. And now I got a little bit nervous. I think my predictions are going to be a little tighter than it would have been than if we recorded the first time. And, uh, they played well, uh, still lost, still lost, but they lost to a six, no Indiana team that just beat us. So I can't hold it against them. They look like a better team than I thought they were. Yeah. And again, you know, I thought they, they showed flashes, but again, you know, I think kind of what we saw late from Northwestern is kind of the biggest question from them really all year is that, you know, just they, they kind of lack some of that offensive firepower. And, uh, you know, Bryce Kurtz, that wide receiver, uh, I believe it's the sixth year. Um, he really had the monster game for them, six ca- or 10 catches, 128 yards. Uh, AJ Henning, pair of touchdowns as well. Uh, but again, you know, I think o- offensively, uh, Northwestern seems like they, they kind of leave a little bit to be desired. Um, and again, Indiana um you know they 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 were hands down the better team yesterday yeah they lost to indiana who's six and oh they lost to washington who is a highly ranked team for most of the year it ends up they're not in the rankings anymore i don't believe um but they were high expectations and did great last season they lost to duke that's that's something i don't think maryland would do we seem to beat the snot out of all these acc teams they put in front of us um but they did beat miami oh of ohio Okay, Miami of Ohio um, and Eastern Illinois. So they haven't beat anyone, but also two of their losses could be excused. So we can't play like shit. That's all I'm saying. If we play average to above average, I think we can win this game. But we've laid some eggs this year that would cause us to lose to Northwestern, and I'm scared. (laughs) Yeah, I got you. And again, you know, I uh, I was talking with a couple people about it this weekend. And again, you know, I think, you know, this uh, it sounds cliche, but, you know, the Terps first Terps, you know, the dolls back to, you know, really Maryland doing what Maryland needs to do. And if Maryland does what it needs to do, then, yeah, I, I, there's not much doubt in my mind uh, that really Maryland can make this this Northwestern team uh, one dimensional. Obviously, as I mentioned, Bryce Kurtz, uh, A.J. Henning, you know, both those guys do pose a threat. And, you know, this secondary, this young secondary, um, it was known kind of going into – 
the, I mean, but it was known going into the season, you know, there, a lot of these young guys would have to play, you know, Perry Fisher, Jalen Husky, but those guys had their stretches for sure. Um, but behind them, um, you know, what is proven similar can be said, you know, for wide receiver to lesser degree, you know, obviously Octavian Smith, um, you know, he, he showcased himself, had that touchdown last year against Michigan State, had his flashes, Shalik Knotts, um, he, he's kind of had some flashes this year, and I, that uh, that nice catch along the sideline against Indiana. Um, but again, you know, back back to the, that cornerback room, um, it's a chance for them to really take away the big plays, kind of keep everything in front of them. Um, and that's kind of that area where Maryland can take that next step and something that they can show uh, this week on film, uh, especially with USC right around the corner. So we lost the turnover battle against Virginia and we won and we won the turnover battle against Michigan state and Indiana and lost. So do we just need to like throw a couple of interceptions early and just get this out of the way? Just make yeah. sure we lose the turnover battle. We just is, that, gotta, is that the game plan? We just got to match, <laughs> match their turnovers. Whenever, whenever, just, whenever, whenever there's a Northwestern turnover, just, or, or just, just, punt, just, punt, just punt the just ball punt. first down. Yeah. Oh yeah. That was actually, that was my game plan. When William likely who's now on the coaching staff was on the team, I used to root for us to punt early so that we could get William likely the ball back again. <laughs> so we can, <laughs> oh no man uh you know it's hard it's this is the most stressful time of year as a terps fan because i'm a diehard and bleed early and uh, i'm follow all this, the social medias and read all this stuff and i see all the angry tweets and all the angry posts and all the hate from everybody and i just can't imagine what it's like to be these players or these coaches because like it hurts to be me like i don't i i i, I wish that we could just get this back right. I still see a possibility. Yeah. We were never going to lose less than two games. Obviously, we just saw Minnesota beat USC. I never thought that Minnesota was unbeatable by us, so I guess this now makes USC beatable by us, or maybe they're both going to beat us. I don't know, but we need to get our stuff straight. The offensive line has to get better. The wide receivers have to be healthy. That's really all it is. They were playing pretty damn well all year and even well in this game to tell you about. We did get a little depth work. I will say that one good thing about this last game that you had your wide receivers three, four, five in every in at every snap past the third quarter, basically. Schleek Knotts looked pretty good. Brandon Zizlowski, I always mess up his last name, looked pretty good out there and seemed to know what he was doing again, giving Prather directions out there. Uh so hopefully that helps. Hopefully it pays dividends. It all comes down to the offensive line just scaring the crap out of me and our defensive backfield. They're not even bad. They're just like, like opportunistic. Like they're unbelievable at turnovers, but not so good at just coverage. Just, just stop them from throwing the ball. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, some of, some of the turnovers. I mean, Jalen Husky. I think you know, a couple, two or three of them. I mean, uh, you know, they were just simply overthrows. So it was just kind of Maryland taking taking advantage of the miscue there or the you know the miscommunication. So, uh, you know, def definitely a couple of those. But again, yeah, I think you know uh, Northwestern's front seven. No, Antosaka, that'll be a familiar name, former four star from the area. Um, so so that that he's one piece for him. But uh again, you know, I think uh this this Maryland offensive line, um they, they, they have a chance to really assert their dominance, uh win the trenches. Um I think this is really that chance for for them to kind of build some confidence. Well, I think mean, Vegas seems to agree with you. We are uh, nine and a half point favorites with only a forty four point over under. So that's a nice little advantage of that number. Uh, how do you see this going? Do you see those numbers hitting? Where, where do you got your, where's your money at? Yeah, I'm going to go with Maryland when pulling this out 2710. Um, again, you know, I think just kind of with this bye week, um, really felt a sense of just, you know, Maryland kind of needs to dial into, you know, just doing what it needs to do. Um, there's definitely a sense of that during the Michigan or following the Michigan State loss. And I think kind of with this bye week, with it really, you know, two weeks to really let it just settle. Um, I think Maryland really has a chance to, to really want to come out. Um, and I think that they're going to start out hot. Um, and I think this is a game, again, you know, on, on paper, Maryland does stack up well. That's why you play the game. Um, and again, I, I just think kind of with the way the first season has gone and, and kind of Loxley and his staff chance to – really drill into, you know, getting the little things right in practice these last two weeks. Um, I expect Maryland to to get back in the win column. Um, they need to. Uh, again, you know, we, we saw a similar status last year uh, going into the, the bye week and then coming out uh, that that road game against Northwestern and Maryland fell short. Um, this is really a chance to, to kind of turn the tide from that. Um, and, and like I said, just build that positive momentum back up. So I think back in College Park, Friday night, uh, Friday night lights, uh, Maryland should do it. 
Yeah, we we need to. Like you said, for so many reasons, getting back on the even size schedule, getting back to uh, on track for the bowl week because you really can have no missteps on your projected wins at this point. Every You have to win everything that ESPN says you're supposed to win at this point to get to six. Um, and then we also really need to get rid of that stat that locks can't win coming out of the bowl game. I just never want to hear it again. I just want it. I don't even want to hear he's one and eight or whatever it is next year. We'll just erase it. We'll make sure it's gone forever. As long as we can get this win. Uh, I don't know. I, I think that they will win. I am a little worried that the fans don't do their job around here. We've talked about it many times. I think the stadium's going to be kind of empty. You're coming out all hyped up and hot for Friday night lights and you see, I don't know, a 50, 60% full stadium and you're a little flat and then you give a bad team hope early. So if you're right and they start hot, I'm going to be feeling great from the get and it's probably going to be a blowout. It's that, that let down and letting a bad team have hope that always gets us in trouble. <sighs> I'm going to go a little tighter here. I probably... I'm going to take Maryland to win. I don't know if I can lay the points. It's going to be close. 27-17. So right there at the line, I'll give us the points, but it's going to be a sweat. It's going to be a half-point shaker there. Um, Last week, like I said, we had our hot predictions. I know that mine was Prather over 80. I missed, but if the touchdown stands, I don't. So I'm going to take a half victory lap there. I forget what yours were. Do you remember what yours was? No, two weeks ago. Yeah, but we'll uh, we'll assume though Ahmed got it. (laughs) (laughs) I'll take Uh, I'll take the assumption, but take uh, the win. Like like I said, you know, big 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 chance to get back on track, build some positive momentum this week, and I think uh, I think a lot of fans, you know, at this point, you know, they 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 kind of want to see Maryland kind of prove it at this point. Um, And like I said, you know, chance chance to kind of do that with with USC right around the corner. And we had to bury it because we couldn't just reward these fans that just jumped a basketball season without finishing football, without getting through and really giving these guys a chance. But we did get a big commitment this week. You want to tell the guys about our uh, commitment for the basketball side of things? Yeah. Um, Mount Zion, Brett, four-star guard, Chris Jeffrey, finally pulled the trigger, uh, announced his commitment to Maryland over Texas A&M, Mississippi State. Uh, been a long time uh, kind of leaning that way, uh, told the staff. Uh, officially back in mid-September that he was planning on coming, uh, made his way to campus with his, with his coaching staff uh, to, and, you know, also watch Malachi Palmer, his, his former teammate, high school teammate and current Maryland freshman guard, uh, it, you know, watch him in practice, but obviously get a chance to reconnect with the, the coaching staff. Obviously, you know, Kevin Norris, um, he does, uh, he's just well connected throughout Baltimore and knew the staff very well. Greg Manning Jr. Uh, led the way on Chris Jeffrey from the start. Um, uh, Kevin Willard did a really good job just kind of connecting with Jeffrey, uh, both of those guys connecting just with that New York connection, uh, with Jeffrey being, uh, originally from Brooklyn. Um, and then again, obviously David Cox, you know, just always bouncing around, around the area. So, um, you know, the, the, that Mount Zion prep staff, you know, there was a lot of trust in both Maryland's coaching staff, the development plan, just this being really the best fit for him. Um, and again, I think kind of Chris Jeffrey, was dialing into, um, you know, kind of took his initial, com- or took his official visit to Maryland back in uh, late June. Um, was always consistent that he wanted to take his the decision into late fall or mid fall before uh, his senior year kicked off. And uh, Maryland kind of stayed consistent with him. I uh, got a chance to watch him through uh, the AAU period through the summer as well. So uh, obviously he gets a chance, uh, combo guard, but I think he really gets a chance uh, where he proved himself this, this summer. Uh, to kind of uh, to fill in as a point guard there. Uh, obviously joins Marcus Jackson, four-star uh, in the class, a Baltimore native as well. So um, that, I think that's a really, really big fan of Chris Jeffrey, 6'3 guard, uh, and that is the second top 100 commit this cycle. Sounds good. The team looks big. They look strong. They were sitting next to us at a Michigan State or whatever game it was. They nice. came over on the fringes of the uh, of the student section by us to – give themselves a little space in the gap that is usually the away team seating that I sit with there always ends up being an interesting group of characters that fills that in. Uh, Dare queen looks big as hell. Julian Reese looks like he's putting on a little weight still getting even bigger. I think it was, it's underrated 
to be able to keep Geronimo. I mean, I'm sure that Willard had to go to him and be like, look, you're not starting anymore. It's a weird thing to take a step back like that, but we'd love to have you as a, as a production piece. You know, this will be just another one of those years that we'll look at each other and we'll be like, these are these guys are seven or eight deep. And then they won't be eventually. They'll just not be seven or eight deep. But, you know, it, it, you, they definitely are bigger. They're definitely stronger. We got guys that can play and give Julian Reese a break now, which we really didn't have last year. And the three-point shooting can't get much worse. Uh, we can't see that until we actually see it in games, but it can't get much worse than it was. So yeah. I guess we're going to see an improvement there. Yeah, I think Maryland probably should be a better shooting team this year. Um, and again, you know, yeah. I think you know, last year, you know, Jimmy Young kind of leading that way. Um, you know, I think Maryland has a chance to kind of turn to a couple of different pieces. Jacoby Gillespie kind of does a little bit of everything, a little bit of scoring, kind of just distributing, leading the offense. Something Miguel has a little bit of an outside shot. Sean Harris Smith, I think he'll be an interesting case, but Julian Reese, um, you know, just again, remaining efficient around the rim. Uh, Derek Queen has a little bit of range to his game, you know, kind of the mid range. And, you know, I, I've said it before, but watched him when he was a freshman at uh, St. Francis. He has the outside game adding to it. Uh, how comfortable, how frequently is he used? Uh, but, you know, he definitely candidates to fade on that pick and pop where you have Julian Reese down in the paint. They're not, uh, they're, they're not kind of eating that same space. So, um, again, I think there's, there's, there's some reason to optimism. It's for optimism. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how it all kind of comes together. But, uh, you know, uh, Marquette, Villanova, Syracuse on the non conference schedule and uh, Wild Big Ten slate. Yeah, basketball is just a wild beast. Like, I mean, you talk about the outside game. I mean, Julian Reese is a freshman, had a, had some streaks where he was able to hit from the outside. Now it, it doesn't yeah. look like he can hit a free throw. I mean, I'm the guy that was a full-on Eric Ayala truther after his freshman year. I thought he was going to be, like, the highest-scoring player in the history of Maryland, and that did not work. Uh, so I try to just, you know, take all my takes in Maryland basketball with a grain of salt because apparently I know nothing about basketball. <laughs> Yeah, Ayala definitely shot him and Fats. I'll never just my, my lasting images of them will be just them shooting their way into the record books that last three months of the season during that Danny Manning year. So that was a uh, boy, that was a fun season and fun, <laughs> fun is in quotations, that's for sure. Yeah. But uh, the, the season opener is less than a month away, and on the media day is actually this week. So uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, how, how, how this team unfolds. Well, that's great, but it's still football season, so I'm going to be down here this Friday in the shell, Section 7. You know, it should be a good game. I'm going to have a lot of fun, but also I'm excited to see all these fun toys in this stadium in the dark. It's the... That every year I try to go to a primetime Ravens game for the exact reasons. Football's just more fun at night when they have all of this extra show. It's like a Vegas spectacle, and I'm excited to see what they do with it because I think they've been doing a really good job with the production side of things. They got it tuned in. The sound's great. The video production's better. The lights look good. So to see it full effect at night should be worth the price of admission all by itself because I think you can get in for like $12 right now, guys. So come on down, spend a Friday night with us in the shell and give these guys a little extra energy, make it worthwhile. Let's get some wins. Let's stack them up. Let's make this USC game worth going to and shock the world like everybody else. Why not? I mean, this weekend you had like nine of the top 12 teams lose to yeah. nobodies. Like it... Nothing says that these teams are said can't be beat by us. We have the weapons. So... Let's not give up yet. These numbers aren't that bad. We've lo- we're gonna we were gonna lose two games this season. Let's hope we don't lose any more. That's unrealistic, but let's just try it. Let's. I don't know, guys. Until next time, here's wishing all is well under the shell. <laughs>